Well, welcome to the Douglas County Chamber's Greystone Power Luncheon. Um, I am Kara Pearson with Greystone Power, your 2018 Chairman of the Board. Um, I would like to invite Pastor Steve McFall with the Central Baptist Church to come forward and lead us in our invocation, and then Ken Reeves with the Georgia Highlands College to lead us in our pledge. Well, good afternoon. Let's join together in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next, I would like to invite our sponsor, Dr. Don Green, president of Georgia Highlands College, to come forward. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for allowing us to be the sponsor for the luncheon today. Uh, starting out, I think I should just explain, GHC is a primarily two-year institution here in Douglasville, but we also have four-year degrees and we are part of the University System of Georgia. We are coming up on our 10th anniversary of being here in Douglasville and we're very, very pleased about that. We're pleased to be a part of the community. If I could, could all the GHC employees that are here please stand? These folks and all of our faculty and staff truly care about students. And I would be remiss if I did not point this out. I've mentioned it at previous uh, chamber gatherings here. For all of you who have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, nieces, nephews, that you hope to have attend college, how many of you typically say to those, to those students, you need to go to college? How many of you? Stop saying that. <laughs> what I would like you to do is start telling them they need to finish college. They need to graduate. And for some of you say, and get out of my basement. <laughs> Which we'll hear more about today, right? It's a little joke, just a little joke. Um, we would be, I would be remiss, we would be remiss if we did not talk about some of our partners. So I just want to very quickly say we have great organizational partners. A great example of that is the Douglas County Chamber of Commerce. We have great educational partners. Douglas County Schools are one of those terrific partners. And as one example, we have great companies as partners. Fastenal, based here, is uh, one of our great corporate partners and in fact works with us on our bachelors in logistics and supply chain management. And I'm really pleased to mention one more new partner for Douglas County and that is University of West Georgia. We are now having conversations with UWG about working together at our Douglas site to bring two plus twos, associates plus bachelor's degrees. And we're very proud of our affordable, high quality associate's degrees. You can complete an entire associate's degree for $8,000, everything. But we're even more excited to be able to pair that together with a variety of bachelor's degrees from University of West Georgia. So with that, thank you very much once again for allowing us to sponsor, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Kara. Yes, thank you, Don. Uh, we appreciate the Georgia Highlands um, College uh, support and for making today's lunch impossible. So, um, it is now my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Douglasville native, Dr. Kent Wessinger. He is committed to elevate nations, organizations, and corporations that are forfeiting growth because they are hemorrhaging their millennial workforce and meeting their innovative ideas of value. 
He used the outcomes of his globally implemented research on the transition from escalating crisis to sustainable growth to found the Create to Elevate Foundation. Kent is currently a faculty member at Gateland University in Belize and Point University in West Georgia. He graduated with Lithia Springs High, from Lithia Springs High School and later earned his PhD from Prescott College in Sustainability Education with a research emphasis in economic sustainability within the structures suffering from migration. Please join me in welcoming Kent. Thank you so much for those kind words. It's fantastic to be here. I consider it a great honor. Uh, and at many levels, it's very surreal knowing that I grew up out here in this community, just walking up here. I mean, how many of us knew that, well, uh, probably most of us. I mean, I, when I was walking up the street, I was expecting O'Neill's at right there where City Hall is. That's how long it's been since I've been gone. So uh, it's, uh, the growth is amazing. And, uh, but I have to tell you that uh, knowing that my roots are embedded deep into this community. It means a lot to me to be here. It feels full circle. I left 25 years ago and moved to the Caribbean. And uh, I lived in Jamaica for a number of years and then I moved over to the British Virgin Islands in Tortola. And then I moved, lived the last 10 years in St. John in the US Virgin Islands. And, uh, and I will say that I've, I've just been blessed with an incredible life. And so it's wonderful to be back. It's wonderful to be home. And I thank you for the opportunity. And, Thank you, Ken, for making this and the, the chamber for making this available. So without further ado, I want to talk about this subject here that is relevant to everyone called millennials. But before we go there, I, I want you to know something. Um, I, we're not going to camp out just on millennials, even though that's a perspective and that's an issue that all of us want to address. It's an issue that all of us are, are dealing with and trying to manage forward. If many of us are employers, owners, uh, you know, maybe employees, and, and we're dealing with this millennial issue. But, but as we go through this today, I want you to keep in mind and put on one particular lens. We're not trying to achieve an objective to appease millennials. We're not trying to solve this, just this millennial issue. The biggest and the most broad issue that we're trying to accomplish is sustainable growth for all of our organizations. What we're, many of us are trying to, to, to accomplish fortify, secure profitability moving forward. And if, if, if our objective is just millennials, I can promise you that sustainable growth and sustainable profitability is not going to be the outcomes that we're going to achieve. But if we are, if we are truly searching and striving for sustainable growth and profitability, but understand that we have an impediment right here and we need to manage this impediment well, we're going to achieve the things that we need to achieve. And then one more little precursor. It's important to understand that as we begin to talk about millennials, that millennials have not just become the greatest population, the highest greatest population sect that we have in this country, but millennials are reconstituting a lot of structures that we hold absolute. And we're going to talk about that today. But before I go there, I want to tell you why I did this and why this is important and why that we have to overcome this impediment. Can I step away from this microphone? Or will it mess up a recording or anything? It, I, <laughs> yes, I can step away, or yes, it will mess up the recording. Yes, it will mess up the recording. Okay, I'll stay right here. <laughs> I had six shots of espresso this morning, so standing behind this lectern is not easy. <laughs> as, I was, as I was finishing up uh, PhD research, and that is what it is, I, I was studying the relationship between socioeconomic crisis and, 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 and innovative environments in, in cultures that seem to be steeped in socioeconomic crisis. And, and, and one of the reasons that I was studying that is because the culture that I was living in in the Caribbean, but many of us may or may not know that the highest concentration of immigrants that come into this country come from the Caribbean. 2.3 out of every 10 immigrants that come into this country come from the Caribbean. And, and, and I, I was, I was a little perplexed at why, why a region that we call paradise, that many define as paradise, are, are migrating away from what we consider paradise, where they're going, what they're doing, and why they're migrating. And I'm not going to get into all of those issues, but, but, but I will say one thing as a statement of hope for anyone here. When Ken and I graduated from Lithia Springs High School, if they would have lined all of us up in a straight line and lined the faculty up in front of us and says, who is the guy least likely to write and publish a textbook in their lifetime? Unanimously, they would have picked me, 
Okay, so there's hope that we can achieve things in, in other areas. But, but that research got published, and, uh, and for some reason, I, as, as I begin, that began to mature, I began to notice some tendencies between this relationship with socioeconomic crisis in innovative environments with millennials in relation to migration. And when we begin to talk about this conflict and influence of migration, it's also important to note, as we begin, and we'll talk more about this in just a second, that today, the average millennial only stays on the job 16 months. 16 months. Now, I want you to think about that as we move forward, because this research tool that I put together um, is a research tool that I'm going to bring you that contrasts two different demographics. It's going to contrast the first-hand voice of millennials with the first-hand voice of, I'm combining two demographics, baby boomers and Gen X. And the reason I've done that is because as I begin to research this phenomenon of, of the influence and conflict of millennials, I begin to recognize that a lot of the material, a lot of the books, a lot of the data out there, as I researched it back, I recognized that it was built on assumption and personal observation and not based on fact. And you see, there's many of us in this room that are making hardcore financial structural decisions and trying to develop a trajectory of growth out in front of us. And we're trying to develop this trajectory of growth based on what a lot of people are producing is assumption and personal observation. And those are not going to get us into growth and profitability. And so it was important to me, coming from an academic perspective, to produce a tool that would also produce outcomes of relevant, real, truthful information to give us the opportunity to build a future based on factual data. And so today, and you may see this on your table, and I, and I would appreciate if all of you could do it. It's very important to me, but not right now. We have an online survey that has 30 questions in it. It takes one minute to take it. There's a millennial survey and there's a non-millennial survey. Today we have over 20,000 participants in that research tool. And so what I'm able to do is we're able to contrast that to give you this information because this information is important to you and your future. Now, I'm one of those that has millennial children at home. If you have millennial children at home, millennial children, raise your hand. By the way, the U.S. Census Bureau, almost all of us. The U.S. Census Bureau defines a millennial born 1982 to 2000. I have three at home. My youngest, Sam, is a senior in high school. He's in the last year of being a millennial. About eight or nine months ago, he calls me. He, he tells me, Dad, I've got a girlfriend now. I'm like, great. He said, but she lives in Brazelton, which is 30 miles from Athens where I live. He says, Dad, um, um, I hope you don't mind me going back and forth. No, I don't mind you going back and forth. About three months after um, he had you know, entered in this relationship, he calls me at 12.30 one night. Some of us know when we get a call at 12.30 at night from our 17-year-old son or daughter, we get a little upset. So I answer the phone, and he goes, Dad, I'm leaving Rebecca's house, but I'm lost. I said, lost? He said, yeah, my map app's not working on my phone, Dad. <laughs> and I said... I said, dude, how, how many times have you driven to Rebecca's house? He goes, that's not even the point, Dad. <laughs> I said, so, I said, are you going north or south? He goes, my map app is not working, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then it progressed, are you on a big road, a small road? <laughs> of course, I'm on a highway, Dad. And so I said, well, are you going toward Atlanta or South Carolina? And I heard it again. My map app is not working, Dad. Well, we finally got him home. I think that all of us, and I, I'm sorry, I, I noticed that everybody above millennial age is laughing. Everybody that's a millennial is not laughing at all. But, <laughs> but, but I want you to know this. I, I think we could go around the room and we could all tell a millennial story, right? But you know, we could go around with the millennials and they all can tell a baby boomer Gen X story too, right? Am I correct about that? We, 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 so we all have those stories, and, and, and because of those stories, we have a lot of conflict and influence between these two demographics. And, and one, one last thing, to give you another case of perspective. Um, last year, I was blessed with this amazing opportunity to go to Tortola and give a TED talk on the, the, the research piece I did about the Caribbean. When it was over with, this nice young couple came up to me and befriended me and asked me to go to dinner the next day, and, and I did, and, 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 and they live in Nashville. And, 
And we got back, um, he, they're both 27 years old, and he emailed me and he goes, Kent, I know that we just met, he said, but uh, I, I've sent you this mentorship um, form, and, and I think this is a great mentorship program, and I would appreciate it if you would consider this. So, you know, I'm thinking, wow, he wants me to mentor him, feel great about it, he's in the banking industry, he's, gonna, he's, gonna, he's a very sharp young man. So I open up the, the form, and the, and the mentorship program was, millennials mentoring baby boomers in Gen X. So he wasn't asking me to mentor him, he was asking him to mentor me. And so when I looked into this, this program, are you ready for this? There's over 500,000 participants in this mentorship program today where millennials are, 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 are mentoring baby boomers in Gen X. And so we can talk for a lot about this conflict and this influences here. Which way do I, okay. And so, and so what are we going to learn quickly from today? Because I'm going to quickly go through this. I'm just going to scratch the surface because the survey extracts data and information based on about seven different sectors in our culture. I can't go into all of those and I can't even really go into them in depth today, but these are the three things. We're going to come away with kind of a skeleton of each of those, but the most important one we're going to come away with is a lens to understand. And so the first question in the survey says this, what one word best describes millennials? And this is where we're going to get interactive. I need four answers from you. So what's the first word that comes, and you can't be a millennial. Well, what is, because remember, this is coming from the baby boomer Gen X. I'm going to give you a shot, I promise. This coming from baby boomer Gen X. What is the first word that comes to your mind when you think of millennial? Yes, ma'am. Snowflake. Snowflake. Randy. Unpredictable. Unpredictable. In the back. Technology. Technology. Who else? Confusing. Confusing. <laughs> I need one more. One more. Self. Self and what, what was that? What? Self. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Distracted. Distracted. Okay. Now, now I want to take, I'm going to step away for just one second, but I want to point out in the baby boomer genetic survey, we have 3,000 participants. This quarter is chunked by almost 2,000. So it's, we have almost 5,000 participants in this. So when you think of that big of, of, uh, of pool, I want you to think about this. What one word best describes the millennials? The top six answers are entitlement, lazy, selfish, unreliable, irresponsible, and spoiled. Wow. And so as I look around the room and I see quite a bit of head shaking, I think that everyone here, most people here, can identify to that on some level. But let's, let's look beyond this. We have to process that lazy, selfish, entitled perspective if it's real, if it's a real outcome, if it's a real atmosphere. We have to process it through the fact that they are the largest demographic today. And, and millennials aren't just coming, millennials are here. M -m millennials today, they hold a lot of eggs in a lot of baskets that we're going to communicate with about here in just a few moments. And so I, I want to ask you as we move forward. If, if you want to build a business, develop a business, was it Switch? Is that was, if you want to develop Switch in this community, are you going to build Switch based on an employee group that is entitled, lazy, selfish, all of those things? There's no way you're going to do that. There's no way you're going to purposely go out and seek lazy, entitled, selfish employees to build a multi-billion dollar business. There's no way you're going to do that. And so then you go, well, wait a minute, they're the largest demographic that we have in this country today. Wait a minute, they hold a lot of technology seats in this country today. So all of a sudden, this conflict becomes a reality, and many of us can process what that cover that Time magazine says, me, 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 but I'm going to argue as we go through and let the cat out of the bag a little bit. I'm not so sure the research supports that millennials are the me, me, me demographic. I'm ashamed to tell you that I think the research supports that baby boomers and Gen X are actually the me, me, me demographic. And so we're, we're going to talk about that. But millennials aren't coming. Millennials are here. So think about this. Here's the contrast. And I call them the Xers. These are baby boomers and Gen Xers. Okay. They say that entitled, lazy, selfish, unreliable, irresponsible, and spoiled are millennials. But look how millennials define themselves. Innovative, creative, smart, passionate, progressive, optimistic. Okay, I, I'm sorry to keep picking on this because I, I don't really know. We'll, we'll say the Douglas County Economic, what was it called? Development Authority. If the Douglas County Economic Authority is going to continue to have sustainable growth and profit, can government profit? They can't? I don't know. We'll just say they can, okay? 
<laughs> Our president says they can, so we will, okay? So if we're going to think about that, we don't, we're not going to hire entitled, lazy, selfish people. We want to hire innovative, creative, smart, passionate, progressive, optimistic people, right? We, we want to hire people that see themselves that way, that think of themselves that way. But it has to be more than just this, this metaphysical perspective of the way that I see themselves. There has to be some depth to this, right? Well, we can say we're innovative, but are we innovative? We can say we're creative and smart and optimistic and progressive, but, but are we? But, 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 but before we move on from this slide, I, I want you to, to, to see this is a level of understanding of why this conflict exists. We have two demographics that see millennials one way, and we have millennials that see themselves as another way, and you can see these are not in the same hemisphere with one another. And actually, they're, they're in two totally different worlds, right? And so as, as we process that and, and go forward, I, I want to ask you this question. How many of you are concerned about a future with millennials? How, how many of you are concerned about building structure with millennials based on your perspective? And, 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 and that concern, because many of you are, that concern has developed some behavioral patterns that we see in the research. And, and here's an example of one, and this is the only way I, I, that I know how to communicate this effectively. How are we, as traditional leaders, attempting to build a future with our millennial customer base? H how many of us have been, by chance, to St. John in the U.S. Virgin Islands? If you have, raise your hand. Oh, my gosh. It's pretty awesome, right? Yeah. Can you believe I lived there for 10 years? <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> okay, when you got off the plane in St. Thomas, it was chaos. You remember that? You have all these taxi drivers saying, get my taxi, get my taxi, get my taxi. They're trying to take you to the ferry dock because the only way to get to St. John is by boat. So you have to take a ferry over to St. John. When you're taking the taxi over to the ferry, you have to go, you have to travel on that road right there. The problem is, is that if you notice, there's water right here. So every time there's a storm swell or a tide that comes in, guess what happens to that road? It's completely submerged in water. So this went on for decades. Well, if the water is, if the road is submerged in water, the taxi drivers have to take the long road, which means they have to scale all of these horrible mountains. This is a 20 minute route. To scale the long terrain up and down the mountains is an hour and 20 minutes. And so what happens is, is tourists get to the ferry dock and before they can even get on the boat with all the seas, they're already sick from riding in the back of taxis. So what happens is you have a lot of conflict at, at, at the ferry dock because people had to take the long ride. And who was, who was receiving all of the anger at that? The taxi drivers. So the taxi drivers, the taxi drivers had an idea. Let's build a bridge that's over that water higher than the water level will ever come. So the government says, great, we'll build a bridge. We'll solve the problem. The only problem is, it's been 22 years since the bridge was built. The road has never been connected to the bridge. So this bridge is sitting right here. The road is still right here. If you ride by that today, there is a plastic table and four plastic chairs sitting right in the middle of the bridge where four old guys play dominoes every single night and drink Hanukkah. It is the, I, I call it the most expensive domino table in the world, right there. So I, I'm saying that to you to say that we're concerned, a lot of us are concerned about how we can build a future with millennials. And one of the things that we're doing is we're building structures that are familiar. We believe that we're listening. Hey, I put an ear up there. We believe that we're listening. We believe what we're hearing, but we're still doing the same things that we've been doing in the past. And so, uh, look, it's important to note this, and I don't want to overlook this fact. Our country is, if it is, and many of us consider it as great, if our country is great today, it's great not because of millennials. Sorry, millennials. Our, company, our country is great because the generations that paid sacrifices that went before you as millennials. Our, our, our country is in a financial position because of the generations that went before you. Our structures, our structures, they may not be perfect, but, but, but they're still the leaders in the world. And our structures are good and efficient and sustainable because of the demographics and the generations before millennials. 
And you see, so all of a sudden, here comes this demographic that says, I'm not sure I respect that structure. Or I'm not sure I'm going to go along with that process. And it becomes personal and offensive to many of us because we know that we built our businesses through these traditional structures and these traditional methods. And those traditional structures and methods are what we got us to this place. But, but, but look, let me give you an example of, of how we can build bridges to nowhere. Because listen, as we're thinking about sustainable growth and sustainable profitability moving forward, none of us want to waste money on bridges that go nowhere. All of us want to construct realities that have outcomes of sustainable growth and profitability and be efficient with the way that we spend money as we move forward. So thinking about millennials changing jobs every 16 months. If you had one of your top talent employees come to you 15 years ago and said, look, Ken, I'm thinking about, you know, X, Y, Z, Switch offered me a better job. They offered me $10,000 a year, they offered me a corner office, they offered me benefits, and I'm just letting you know. But we recognize them as our top talent, so what do we do? We say, we'll match it, we'll give you an office, and we'll give you the same benefits if you will just stay here with us. But look at this. What is the number one reason from a millennial survey that you left your last job? Number one, not heard. Two, lack of creativity. Inflexible. Look where pay is. Number four. We are responding to retention, talent acquisition, human resource issues based on the structures of the past. And because we're responding to them based on the structures of the past, what is happening is, is the millennial tension rate has plummeted and millennials are moving at a higher rate because, look, I know this might sound a little bit difficult, but we, if we're not responding in a method with a process that's going to be effective, we are setting ourselves up to construct bridges that are going to be expensive and not accomplish the goal of sustainable growth and profitability. Where we saw it before as the number one reason um, to, 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 uh, how we utilize companies are utilize, what do we utilize to keep our employees pay increase, position promotion, fringe benefits, and others. So when we look at that reality, what do you think when you see that reality? Are you instantly going, not heard? Who do they think they are? <laughs> are? Are you going entitled, lazy, selfish? Who do these millennials think they are being not heard? That's the reason that they're leaving. Or, or we're not giving them a position of, or, or not putting them in a position of creativity. But, but, but look, at, look at this. Does the opportunity for you to present your innovative ideas of influence, your decision to remain with your company, 77% of millennials say, it does. It's important to me to be able to express my innovative ideas and be a participant and, own, and take ownership of the process of how we grow. But when we look at the contrast after that in the baby boomers, only 26% say that's the case. There's a difference between building a bridge to someone and telling them that they have to climb your ladder. And millennials are rejecting ladders, I want to tell you. And that might be hard for some of us to say, but, but, but millennials are rejecting the corporate ladder that says we have, to, we, have to, we have to navigate one rung at a time, and when we're 65 or we're 70, we get a pot of gold at the end of it. Millennials are rejecting that process. You can think whatever you want to think about it. I, I'm not one of those or on either side of them, but it, it is what it is. So, 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 so should we worry about a future with millennials? And, and I promise you that a lot of people here today are going, yeah. We, we, we definitely should worry about them. So I, I want to hang out here for my last few minutes, and I have about seven minutes, right? Is that about seven or eight minutes? Okay. So I want to go down this real quick to formulate a model of growth to assess reality. We've already talked about millennials. are the, so, so that when we get through with this list, I want you to go, they're either going to, millennials are either going to be my source of growth or they're going to remain my source of conflict for the rest of my life. Millennials, we've already talked about, are the greatest population sect if, in this country. If we're struggling with the tendencies of millennials, keep in mind that millennials are also having children. So those tendencies that we perceive could be accentuated in that. Because let's just keep that in mind. On the survey, there's a, there's a question that says, what do you consider, what age do you consider the age of adulthood? In this country for Generations and generations, we have chosen what? 18 is our rite of passage into adulthood. Anybody want to guess what the number one answer is 
for the millennial answer on age of adulthood on the survey? 29. 29 years old. Number one answer. By, 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 by the way, number three answer, you ready for this? Number three answer, 32. The number two answer is 24. So just find a median in there somewhere. So, so, so what, what, what does that say to you? You know, when, you, when you're trying to formulate a model of growth, what does it say to you that there's a demographic that says, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be cool to them about 28 or 29. I'm not going to take those responsibilities. What does that say to you? Maybe we're trying to market. So I met several marketing people. Maybe we're trying to market to a demographic. Maybe we're trying to market to them as adults when they're not seeing themselves as adults. Maybe we're trying to give them adult positions when they don't really want those adult positions. And, and look, I know that sounded awful negative. I don't mean it's come across as negative as it sounds because I'm getting, there's a couple of things that are going to change your mind here. Remember, millennials are changing jobs on the average of every 16 months. Microsoft did a five-year study that concluded last year, what does it cost any size company in this country to replace one millennial? They came away with $24,000 per employee. That $24,000 did not incorporate morale. A lot of other emotional issues that went along with replacing, especially top talent technology positions in the country. I, I can tell you that I work with a, a financial services com company and today, okay, today, they only hire millennials because they recognize where that customer base is. They only hire millennials. They have a 24 month training process. So in 24 months, they hire them, 24 months, they put them out as the face of the company. They budget $100,000 per millennial for that training process. Today, the dropout rate at 12 months is 61%. So what's happened is, is companies that have constructed and forecasted trajectories of growth in the, for, in the future did not forecast what training, how training budgets would explode in their companies because they're having to replace ploys at a much higher rate than they've ever had to replace them before. I'm going to stop right there on that one. Uh, the, in, the, in the research, it talks more about how we can slow that migration down. Purchasing power. No demographic ever recorded has a higher annual purchasing power than millennials. You ready for this? $3.2 trillion a year right now. London School of Economics says $4.1 trillion a year by 2020. That's double of what the demographic per capita had before them. So not only we have the largest population set, we have a demographic that has the highest annual purchasing power ever recorded. 72% of all tech jobs in this country today are held by millennials. Millennials have the highest, you ready for this? Our research says 61% of all millennials above 24 today have a bachelor's degree. In my demographic, in baby boomers, only 31% of us had bachelor's degree. Before that, it was 18 to 19% have a bachelor's degree. The highest educated demographic we've have ever had to this point right now. So education, yeah, education, uh, adulthood, purchasing power, we, we can go on and on. There's a lot of things, but I really wanted to emphasize, I've got two minutes, I'm going to do this quickly, debt and flexibility. What comes along with education, by the way? You know what, and, and that's why these guys are a great deal at $8,000, their associate degree, okay? Highest student loan debt ever recorded from any demographic. Most economists believe that it'll reach $3 trillion in the next 12 months. Um, but, so when millennials begin to think about buying, millennials begin to think about how am I going to reduce my student loan debt, which is a whole other subject. But I want you to think, if, if there's any one thing that I can leave you with today, this is what I want to leave you with. I want you to see millennials is thinking that they have an objective of flexibility. That flexibility issue is monumental, huge in your forecast of changing and, and, and formulating a trajectory of growth moving forward. There's a question in the survey that says this. If you were offered a $50,000 a year job with a flexible schedule or an $80,000 a year job with a rigid schedule, which one would you take? You ready for this? 91% of millennials say they choose a $50,000 a year job with a flexible schedule. It's almost exactly opposite in the contrast to that. There are demographics that said there's no way that I would choose a job for $30,000 less a year 
just to have a little flexibility. But the flexibility piece is so huge. The flexibility, the flexibility feeds into our buying habits. The flexibility feeds, uh, feeds into their perspective. The flexibility issue is huge because of one thing. Millennials, the research shows me, are not the me generation. As a matter of fact, what the research proves out is that the millennial generation's demographic is the we demographic. Millennials are more concerned, burdened, convinced that they should be raising the whole. You see, the me demographic says, I'm going to get an education so I can climb my ladder. I'm going to do this so I can get to the next rung on the ladder. But all of a sudden, here comes the advent of this demographic that says, I happen to care about everybody. I don't see boundaries. I don't see sex. I don't see gender. I don't, well, same thing. I don't see all of those things. I just see people. And I want to raise, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned and I care about all people and I want to see all people raised. And this demographic is very holistic in the way they process, the way they purchase, the way they educate themselves, the way they move forward, the way they raise their family. They're very holistic. And so think about this flexibility issue. In order to be holistic, we cannot be on the job 12 hours a day, 5 days a week, or 6 days a week because it cuts into that flexibility issue that keeps me from being holistic and caring about my community. And so I want to, I, a couple of quick things. Purpose or profit? Millennials don't see their job as producing profit. They see their job as fulfilling purpose, which produces profit. Okay, I'm going to go on. So my, my saying is this. We can either create a future with millennials or millennials will create a future for you. I, I believe one will produce a lot of great heroes as leaders. One is going to produce people that have put up the surrender flag because they did not respond to it in the way they did. And I'm just going to, I'm going to breeze through this one right here. And I promise you, I'll stop, okay? And if anybody wants to get up and leave, it doesn't hurt my feelings. Happens every single time I'm, I'm in the classroom, okay? <laughs> so identity reveals a strategy of profit. And what the research piece shows us is that um, there's an identity that's associated with the BXers, the Gen X and the Baby Boomers, but there is a totally di different demographic we just talked about that's associated with Millennials. And, and it feeds into this conflict in reality that's going on, but it also helps us develop a strategy moving forward. The, the demographics before them, their identity is accumulation based. And I, and I know Millennials see that as a big negative. It's not negative. Our country went through a very difficult time in the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s. And what came out of it what was a demographic of people that said, we have to secure ourselves. And if we don't secure ourselves, we're going to find ourselves in a place of great vulnerability again. Security came through the accumulating layers in our life. Financial security, you know, ownership security, education security, a lot of accumulation so that our, our lives would be secure. Millennials, on the other hand, see that their perspective and their mode of life is not, to, not necessarily to save, by the way. It is to give. It is to be a participant. It is to elevate the whole. And so 88% of BXers in the survey say the most important financial decisions in their life will be home ownership is number one, retirement is number two, and in the survey, our children's education is number three. On the millennial survey, 63% of the millennials say they will intentionally Sorry to all the mortgage bankers in here. Will never own a home in their lifetime. Why? Because millennials see home ownership is a confinement to this little tiny spot for the rest of their lives and it removes the flexibility piece from their lives and impedes what their ambitions are. But you ready for this? In the real estate question that I have? Sorry. In the real estate question that, that one of the real estate questions in the survey says this. The top three financial position, uh, top three financial uh, importances to, to me as a millennial. Um, number three is to own rental property. Number five is to own a home. Millennials see the, the, the possibility, hey, I want to purchase real estate, but I'm going to purchase a rental property because, and then I'm going to live in an apartment, a rented apartment or condo, but I'm going to build my base right here, but I'm, going to I'm not going to put myself in a position where I'm tied down. I want to be flexible so that I can move. So I want you to think about that accumulation, holistic perspective, and then I'll stop here. The theory of holistic capital. A collaborative and accumulated asset measured by the breadth of goodwill. If you truly want a strategy to profit, you truly want a model to grow. 
with this largest demographic that has the highest annual purchasing power ever held, that has a technology perspective like we've never known, who, by the way, embraces behavioral patterns and behavioral structures because of this technology like no demographic we've ever known. I'm encouraging every one of you that are in the demographics before you, if you want to build with millennials, build your community. Get involved in your community. Don't stop writing a check. Now, I'm going to say it again. I'm not saying don't write a check. Stop just writing a check. Get involved in your community. When you get involved in your community, you're going to see your retention rates with millennials skyrocket. You're going to see your talent acquisition. Look, look about 73% of all millennials today in the survey say they will not go to work for a company who is not actively involved in their community. And so I'm going to stop there. Um, there's a lot of things I could say, but I'll stop there. Oh, can I just, I'm going to scroll this, put this on the last one so you can see. So where is it? Yeah, yeah, no, sorry. Hey, if you want the research, there is a book out there. I got to tell you, there's only 18 of them left out there, sorry. Um, but you, you can order it on Amazon too, if, if you want. All the research is in here. It's going to get updated every year. The proceeds from that feed right back into the research project. It's just a, a, a reciprocal research project. So thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Wow. I wish we had a lot more time to sit and listen to that. Um, there's a lot more information I'm sure he could share with all of us, and I'm sure it's facing all of us in our jobs and our leadership roles. Um, let me make sure I'm in the right place. Um, so I want to appreciate him taking out time today. And um, Kent, just so you know that we will be um, donating um, a contribution to a scholarship, for, um, the Chamber Board Scholarship, that which will fund a scholarship for a um, senior, graduating senior this year. So thank you so much for coming out today. Um, Georgia Highlands College has provided some door prizes, so I'm going to ask Don to um, please come forward and help draw all those prizes. Julian's All right. <laughs> Right. Nine three eight. No. All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Nine three five. All right. All right. Nine three nine. Let's read that whole thing out. <laughs> oh, Howard was just wishing. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Um, all right, well, we have a few announcements. Um, the Who Runs the World Women's Leadership Conference is tomorrow, uh, March 21st. It's at the Center of Arbor Connection. Um, it is part of a Chambers Professional Development Series um, that is, um, has been sponsored by Greystone Power. There are a few spots left. Um, so please register on the website. It's $59 for members and $79 for non-members. Um, the deadline to submit leadership Douglas application has been extended to this Friday, um, March 23rd at 5 p.m. Applications are on the website. The Chamber is now also accepting Youth Leadership Douglas applications for the 2019 class. Um, if you know of a sophomore in high school, please encourage them to download the application off the website. And applications, again, are due this Thursday, March 22nd, so just a few days. Um, please join us for the next month's luncheon for the State of the Douglas, 
Douglasville, Douglas County address, featuring some keynote speakers, Chairman Ramona Jackson-Jones and Mayor Rochelle Robinson. Um, this event is hosted in partnership with the Georgia Council for Quality Growth, and the luncheon will be $30 for members and $40 for non-members, and please look up all the other additional information on the Chamber website. Um, and last, our last announcement is, as most of you already know, um, Callie will be moving into her, a new adventure at the end of this month. Um, so we are inviting everyone to come to a Bon Voyage for Kelly Boatwright, if you get the play on words, Thursday, March 29th. It'll be at the Irish Bed Pub at 6 p.m., which is immediately following the Business After Hours that is sponsored um, by the Douglasville Conference Center. So please be on the lookout for more information in our weekly emails. And right now I'm going to ask Kelly to come up and say a few words. Well, nobody said it was going to be easy. Um, thank you all very much, and thank you for a very warm um, embracing of me taking on a new challenge. I have been at this Chamber of Commerce since, for 14 years, since 2004. Um, and when I took this position, I wasn't looking for it. I had someone approach me from the community. I had a great international job. I was traveling and working 70 hours a week, but I also had a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. And I thought, you know what? That may be exactly what I was looking for, but didn't know it. So I took this position thinking, well, it'll be different, right? Something different. 14 years later, I was not looking for a new position. I had someone contact me and said, have you ever thought of doing something at a much bigger chamber? And I thought, hmm, I have a 21-year-old and an 18-year-old who are both graduating from college and high school in May. Maybe it's time to take on a new challenge. So I appreciate all of you giving me what has been the best job in the world for 14 years. The only thing that could possibly make me happier is what happened this morning when Sarah Ray became CEO of this chamber. Y'all, I've worked with this woman for eight years. At her one-year review, her parents reminded me of this, by the way. At her one-year review, she said to me, I said, like every hopefully good boss, what is it that you want to do? What do you want to be when you grow up? And she said, in true Sarah fashion, I want your job. <laughs> and I said, OK, well, let's get you there. So this morning, when the board of directors voted to make Sarah not interim, but the actual CEO of this organization. I figure it took me seven extra years, but you're here. Um, Y'all, she's going to be fabulous. She is going to do great things. They are not going to be my things. She is not Callie. She's Sarah. She's got five totally different strengths than mine, and she is going to use all of those to move you forward. So I don't have any regrets about leaving because I feel like I did my best here, and I know that it's time to hand it off to somebody who's going to take it even further in her own direction. I just pray that y'all will uh, continue to be my friend because I'm going to need lots of friends. I'm going to a community where I know no one. And, um, and I value so much the relationships I've developed here. So I love you all. Please come to my Bone Voyage, very cute boat Bone Voyage. Isn't that adorable? So I hope you'll all be there so I can hug you personally. Um, and I will be here for another couple of weeks. And I have the two best millennials in the world. So. <laughs> I look forward to continuing the momentum with everyone here and I'm very excited and thank everybody that's already kind of come up to me and congratulated and offered support so um, I'll probably be reaching out to you in the upcoming weeks as well as Callie so um, thank you again and just to wrap up we just want to thank Georgia Highlands for being our sponsor today and then Greystone for being our naming sponsor always so um, you guys have a great afternoon thanks.